decency. That's excellent. Mm -hmm. No profanity, no cat jokes, anything like that. Well, cat jokes are allowed. Profanity is occasionally allowed in, in moments of extreme duress. But mostly self-expression is through choice of scrub color. Big thing, big right. thing, right. every morning, thinking about that. And hair is free, freedom of expression in hair and tattoos. I noticed uh, everyone on your staff is tattooed, and I noticed you're the only one without colored hair. Well, I do have colored hair, Brian, because I hate to break this to you, I am gray-haired. So, what? yes, I'm sorry about that. Mark here from Red Star, on location for the first time with Dr. Julia Tomlinson. We've been here tons of times with uh, several different dogs, and Julia's just one of the coolest. And for all you sportos out there, uh, she just has tons and tons of insight into super cool things that we always need to be considering when we're doing athletic type things with our dogs. So she's been nice enough to let me come to her place here, which is Twin City. Animal Rehab and Sports Medicine. There you go. Yeah, so really cool sign. And you've got this new room back here that we haven't seen before. Thanks, Brian, for your help with that. Brian, off camera, super guy. Anyway, <laughs> uh, she's got this room where you're now able to monitor the dogs after the, before and after the treatments and stuff. Right, and, right, so yeah. I can watch them move. I've got some nice matting. We can watch them go over jumps if we need to see. And uh, you know, sometimes do some fitness things with return to resting heart rate, things like that we can look to. Okay, super cool. So let me, uh, before we get into all super, because the monitoring heart rate and all that stuff, none of us do that. Right. And it's so, it's like every single athlete does that. Mm -hmm. It's like a huge part of what you do but none of us do that with our dogs so right. the fact that you're doing that is cool and, and we're going to get to that so but give us the background tell us so you're from Topeka yeah Kansas yeah. yep that's right via Sheffield England yeah, yep okay. yep so born in England and went to veterinary school in England and actually was super interested in orthopedics movement mostly with horses to start with and when I went through vet school Liverpool was very horse oriented mm. it was near Aintree race course and so even though the small animal side of teaching was good it really geared towards horse stuff and plus I was a horse rider so okay. kind of gravitated towards that to start with and went into being trained actually over here as an equine surgeon but again really principal interest sports medicine but the only way to get training in sports med at that time, it's now different, um, in the U.S. was to do a surgery residency. So I worked at the University of Minnesota with the great Tracy Turner, had some really good training in muscles as well as joints and bones and movement. And he used to be a farrier, so he knows all about the foot and the biomechanics of that. A really fun residency worked on sacroiliac joint problems in horses for my master's degree. And then I went ahead and uh, started to work in equine practice, mm. but unfortunately I got injured and actually not with the horses. So a couple of couple of things with car wrecks, not a bad driver, I promise. Mm, okay. <laughs> and uh, ended up not being able to physically do it. Just moving a horse onto the operating table, doing a flexion test, a thousand pound horse versus me, hard enough as a human, yeah. but certainly yeah. harder when you have a shoulder injury. So went through a bit of a, what do I do with my life? Um, moment and then had friends and colleagues who said wow you know you should work with dogs it's just this growing sports medicine it's super young in the canine world of course much longer time period in equine mm -hmm. and i went to go spend some time with the great john sherman who actually used to be a horse vet and had field trial labs down in north carolina and he had gone through some injury and had to reinvent his own career and going through his rehab made him very interested in how to get a dog back to sport. Okay. So he was perfect because he mentored me and knew about all of the great stuff we knew from equine sports medicine and how you can bring that and translate that and what you can't translate to dogs. And um, he was one of the first people, really. I was kind of the second wave, mm -hmm. started to get into rehab and sports medicine, trained in rehab at the University of Tennessee trained in chiropractic, I uh, can't call it that officially if you're not a human chiropractor, but trained in spinal manipulation. Okay. 
and then went ahead and got my specialty, which was the new specialty established in 2010. I got my specialty in 2012 what for was sports medicine. For sports rehab. medicine. Mm-hmm. That was the new specialty. So yeah, so that's now that we've got an equine and canine. You can do one or the other. And, uh, but they're two separate studies. They're two separate. So they're still the same college. It's under the umbrella of the American mm-hmm. College of Veterinary Sports Med and Rehabilitation. Mm-hmm. Um, and now we're training residents, and I actually have a resident here who's training um, with me to become a specialist. There's only 88 canine specialists in the world right now of, the world. of American College of Veterinary Sports Med and Rehab. And we're working on growing, so we really need to start training some younger people. Okay, so you do want to get the word out there that you, mm-hmm. this is what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. And it's just so much information. It's different to other specialties because you're bringing aspects of nutrition and sports training mm-hmm. as well as tissue strength and diagnosis and all of these sort of factions that come from all the other different specialties, but integrating everything together in a very different discipline. Super cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, super cool. And I was thinking, you know, with horses, Horses, <clears throat> people have been actively, you know, I mean, racing horses, jumping. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, in, overall in Europe, but especially in England, horse mm-hmm. culture is, it's a different kind of culture than it is here. But it's also much more popular. It's maybe a little bit more elitish. Is that true? Yeah, it tends to be that the people with a, a higher income bracket tend to own horses just because it's very expensive. expensive. It's expensive any, anywhere, but of course, in Ling- England, land's a premium. So it's a little bit different to so be able to feed your horse pasture. Yeah. You know, when you don't have much land available. Yeah. Yeah. I think some of it, it's that. So I learned to ride actually with a neighbor who had bought horses and then sort of got bitten by the bug and moved from there. You know? Okay. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because, you know, there's just, I would think, so people who, have, obviously the culture there is different here. It was maybe a little bit more work, at least where I grew up. Yeah, cowboys. And, yeah. yeah. But um, when you have money to spend on those things, you have money to take care of your animals and invest. So this, so this study of horse stuff like the things that you're doing with dogs I, I take it it's been going on for a while with horses not so much the rehab approach but the the intense study of how the horse is responding to diet and absolutely and so lo- years and years and years yeah and, and you know we talk we say rehab the new word in the horse world as well relatively the last 15 20 years mm-hmm. which is it's it, medicine moves slowly so we have to understand it's like turning a large boat it takes a long time and a lot of resistance I think. yeah exactly so so bring but when we look at how I used to rehab attendant when I was in practice in England for a year before I came here to do my other training you rehab the tendon by progressively slowly loading by walking that horse in hand very very slowly over months and re-imaging with diagnostic ultrasound to check the tendon was getting structurally more in, intact and then you would progress them to being you know with horse and rider together at slow speeds and then faster and that progressive incremental loading is one of the absolute fundamentals of rehab mm. so we were doing all those things we just weren't necessarily using some of the more exciting modalities such as laser mm. or therapeutics mm-hmm. such as pulsed electromagnetic field therapy and some of these things that have come into equine medicine since i left mm. but i do remember back when i graduated 1996 i remember a horse getting laser on a plantar ligament issue. So, you know, we were, there were people doing it. It just was pretty rare. It was fringe. Versus, yeah, fringe, fringes, exactly. Yeah. And it still is considered by many veterinarians to yeah. be a fringe. Yeah. We're, we're, you know, the establishment of the specialty is hopefully helping people realize that this is actually a branch of medicine and not just, you know, waving the voodoo stick sort of a thing. Well, that's the thing is, it's, I went to this, it's the thing I really like about your program is it's very black and white where we come and see you, we've seen se- had several dogs with you, mm. and you always give us something to do at home, and I think that's where the ball gets dropped by everyone. For example, Danger, now you know Danger had a yes. second ACL, yeah. and you gave us just three or four different exercises, and we did it twice a day for mm-hmm. this many seconds, because with you it's very black and white, and it's almost like wax on, wax off-ish, you know, Miyagi stuff, because yeah. it's like, do this for... 50, hold, hold this pose for 15 seconds, hold this position for 15 seconds, do this just like this 15 times twice a day. Mm-hmm. And you're kind of like... doesn't feel like much, but no, it makes it a huge like difference. No, it doesn't feel like you're doing but it makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. And I went to, uh, I had some issues, and I went to a girl who did myofascial release, mm-hmm. and it was the same thing. And, you know, she helped me by what she did, but mm-hmm. then she said, go home and do this. And, I mean, just these really simple movement things right. that made a huge difference, and, and I haven't suffered from those same things. So it's mm-hmm. interesting. So what are you, so here at your place, we're mm-hmm. in Burnsville or are we in Egan? 
We're in Burnsville. It's kind of on the border of both. It's pretty accessible from the cities. It's kind of southern Twin Cities, mm -hmm. you know, not southern. But so, what do you guys offer here? Let's just talk about that real quick right now. I know you're doing all kinds of. In general, yeah. So, so, so we vary from the the classic sort of rehab case in veterinary medicine is the post-op knee dog, right? So, mm -hmm. helping them get back to building muscle, moving their joint more correctly. Mm -hmm getting all of the tissues strong enough to go back to either chasing squirrels or mm. doing a job. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other sort of classic case is the geriatric dog, multiple mm -hmm. arthritic joints, having trouble getting up off the ground anymore, not able to go on a walk, mm -hmm. needs help up the stairs, help regain mobility as well as we do a lot of pain management here. And then we are actually about 50% a range between 45 and 50% sporting dogs depending on the year. Mm -hmm. And some of those I'm rehabbing them after an injury, so I'm diagnosing a muscle tear or a tendon damage or an orthopedic surgeon's already diagnosed something, but it may or may not have needed surgery, but we're still rehabbing them. We get them back to strength and then we get them back to sport. Mm -hmm. And then I also do baseline sport exams, which are to me very much the most fun. Um, the, the beautiful thing about this job is the variation. Mm -hmm. So to me, problem solving, helping people, they're my number one and number two things that make me feel fulfilled as mm -hmm. a veterinarian. Mm -hmm. And so I get to do so many different things. But the sporting dogs, again, I had a, a dog yesterday who's a flyball dog who's working on getting back, had pneumonia last fall and still hasn't got the aerobic capacity. And part of that's been because the, the trainer has not had time to be able to input the amount of training we need mm -hmm. to try and get that aerobic capacity back. Mm -hmm. And so we did a little check to check there was no sort of alarm bells. And that's what I was talking about, returning to resting heart and mm -hmm. respiration rate after running and how quickly the recovery is. To know that if we did a little bit of running, would that be safe? Would they be recovering within three or four minutes? Mm -hmm. Then I can use that to build a foundation and then incrementally increase that. So that would be an example. But sometimes it's just giving someone a nutrition and cross-training plan. Mm -hmm. I've got a dog who does uh, obedience, agility, scent work. Um, and confirmation and right now she's concentrating on a confirmation show in the summer so I'm going to help her build muscle on her dog to look good nice fast twitch yeah. type 2 muscles right yeah. but generally she needs a bit more of a cross a mix of muscle types for all the things that she does she does coursing as well mm. and so we want those fast twitch but we also want a little more endurance work with some of the other things I haven't covered that she does yeah. and so we'll tweak the plan again after June so those are the fun things for me too you're, well. you're basically like if you go into um, some extreme sport like cycling or, you know, Thai boxing or whatever, you're doing the same thing, mm -hmm. which is crazy. Yeah. Because none of us do. And where, I, where I'm coming from this French ring stuff is not nearly as, it's like. But it's a long time. Well, it is, but it's like in terms of like attention mm -hmm. to these things, preventative attention, diet attention, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. No offense, everybody, but it's kind of like. They're, they don't think about it. It's low. It's lower on the priority it's list than the training. And, yeah, and, and it's just it's kind of baffling for me because once the dog is injured, mm -hmm. there's no training. There's no anything. Yeah, you, you lose know. a lot more time if you, if, if you rather than doing prevention. If you're just doing the treatment, you lose a lot more time in your sport. Yeah. And, and no, you know, there's no way we can prevent any injury, right? But we can try and minimize the chance for that. And it's interesting you talk about attention because. A, in a different way, talking about dog attention, it's very fatiguing. So mental, we've all done it, mentally concentrating on a task is very fatiguing. Yeah. And so if you have something like French Ring where you're not necessarily doing a bunch of endurance work mm -hmm. physically, mm -hmm. but you're still paying attention for a long time and doing short periods of different varieties of motions, the concentration is so fatiguing that that's when you get mistakes, is when you've got a dog who's concentrating so hard all day and you lose that focus, you lose your points, but not only do you lose your points, you're running the risk of something happening. Crazy. Yeah. We don't think about that. Mm -mm. Wow. It's very interesting to be able to work in an all-round pattern to help people with that. Well, I know that I've, one thing I've noticed that is like when the dog is biting, you know, and our dogs have always been really, we call it clean, which means they let go right away, mm -hmm. like within an instant. Mm -hmm. and there's no conflict there. But when they would get tired, they wouldn't. And to me, it was always baffling because I'm thinking, all right, you know, this is work. Mm -hmm. Letting go is not. You'd think that. Right, but it's a conscious action. So yeah. they're not remembering to do the conscious action, and it's the last conscious action that tends to fall off when you get tired. So, oh, that's, yeah. That's enlightening. 
Yeah, so when we're just the same thing as if I'm just using a simple law. So we, look, we use a lot of training here, and I'm not the world's best trainer, but mm -hmm. when we're trying to get a dog, uh, even a pet dog, to go on the exercise equipment to get mm -hmm. stronger, we're using luring, we're mm -hmm. using positive reinforcement, we're using marker words if mm -hmm. we can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes it's, we have to remember to actively get them back off the equipment too, because we, we want them to be able to get off when we say, and not only to not forget to get off, but also to make it a deliberate motion so that they don't just get off in the middle of something while you're concentrating on something else. And then you're, you're concerned about a post-op dog injury. Themselves. Sure, you're, ta you're taking that thing, get on the table, for example, and you're saying this is the beginning, this is the during, and this, this is the, is the uh, end. Yeah. Instead I, of someone just concentrating on getting there. Right. And it never ceases to amaze me how attuned dogs are to minor body motions, both of you and them. It's just, I've accidentally reinforced one foot on something versus two so many times, mm -hmm. just because of my delayed reaction yeah. or the response. It's very interesting. It's amazing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. we don't, it's, it's just, okay. We could talk about. We got to stay on. Keeping you on <laughs> no, task. you're doing great. This is awesome. I just want to make sure I get everything uh, covered. Some of the, some of the things you've already kind of answered for me, which is which is great. But um, you know, obviously rehabbing. Can you can you just explain to everyone without <clears throat> feeling like I'm pressuring you into selling yourself? Why rehabbing is so important? Because I think here in our culture. You know, surgery is the first thing. Right, and it's expensive, yeah. right? So you Everybody's just think like, about, well, you're done. Even, yeah, they don't even think, well, maybe I could rehab this before mm -hmm. surgery. They just think, well, you know, go into the knife, surgery, take a pain pill, mm -hmm. I'll be fine. But rehabbing, uh, there's two things I'd like to ask you. A, uh, if you could take all of the cases you've seen pre-surgery, mm -hmm. uh, and you could just generalize them into a cat, you know, like one figure, what would be the percentage of dogs that you've seen successfully recover from rehab without the need to go to surgery? Oh, it depends on the problem. So certainly when you have a joint instability, we need to somehow stabilize that joint. And, and I use braces for some things too, not just surgical stabilization. It depends on the degree of instability. So, so if we sort of take those in unstable dogs out of the picture, because they're a whole different category. The, the dogs that you can prevent surgery, say, say a shoulder injury where you have a biceps, people talk about biceps release still, that you would cut a biceps if it was just hanging on by a thread. I know it sounds horrifying in some ways, but if it's hanging on by a thread and just acting as an irritant, it's not doing any job, but it's snagging on other structures, then they will still cut the biceps and have reasonable function afterwards. So, so for me, trying to prevent that, a one trying to prevent taking away a shoulder stabilizing muscle as well as an elbow moving muscle that does two things, right? And two, you can try and prevent going through tissue to do surgery. So mm -hmm. as a surgeon in the past, I know that surgery causes things as well as fixes things. On, on the whole, don't get me wrong, surgery is a brilliant way of putting things in the right direction to allow the body to heal itself. That's, that's what surgery is. It's optimizing conditions for the body to heal itself. And if you can't, you put an implant in to keep things together in a better way. So that would like an example of that would be like an ACL, right? Where they put the, 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 the yeah, the so implant, we, like they put some kind of a structure inside the knee to and they change the way the knee has to work yeah. so that you don't need an ACL. Okay. Yeah, okay. so that's kind of like one of those examples where you really are optimally trying to help the knee function better than. Than, than without surgery. If you have a full tear, especially in a bigger dog, it's much more difficult to do anything to try and help that knee move better without surgery. If you have partials, you know, we can discuss that to the moon and back. It's, we still don't know a lot of those things about how much you can recover if you don't have a full tear and how, much, how many progress to fall. Though, you know, veterinary literature has been accidentally biased towards all the dogs that need surgery because they're the dogs we tend to see, right? Yes, so, sure. so again, those, those, those unstable joints are a bit of a separate motion, a separate category to the ones who we're trying to rehab to prevent surgery. And, and, and any good surgeon will tell you they'd rather prevent surgery because they know that they have to disrupt tissue to do surgery, mm -hmm. right? Which has lots of residual effects. Right, so scarring, yep. Going through, you go through a joint capsule, all of those things. Most issues don't heal back to 100% of their original strength, whether they were injured by trauma or whether they were cut through for surgery, right? Okay. But the great thing is the body has an, a huge amount of redundancy, so you really don't need 100% of your tensile strength of your tendon to go do things. Interesting. Right? So the nice thing is that we've got a little bit of leeway. And again, I'm not in any way down on surgery. I used to be a surgeon, and it can be very helpful. But if we can prevent and keep those tissues intact, 
then I'd rather do that and rebuild and try and strengthen a tendon. Even if not all the tendons still attached, if you can strengthen the residual amount of the tendon, mm -hmm. you can often get back to doing quite significant work. The thing I would say is the coursing dogs, the low coursing dogs, they're the ones that after a muscle tear or a tendon injury, it's harder to get them back to full performance because those loads are extreme. Mm -hmm. But even an agility dog who's jumping or an IPO dog, mm -hmm. They, you can get them back with careful rehab, it just takes time. And I think the average person takes, they said, 12 months plus to rehab from an injury. Yeah. Elite athletes, they push it to eight. Yeah. So With ultimate right. environment and conditions. Right, yeah. Okay. So we're working against all of those things that, that people have expectations, perhaps a little more, or more unrealistic with dogs, but when we compare it with human medicine, we're actually bringing them back on par, if not a little bit better. Mm. So I feel like I've circumvented your question, I'm sorry. No, but, no, no, no. You, but, you actually you answered the question okay. exactly. Now, okay. on the flip side of that, how important, without again trying to sell yourself, how important is it to rehab post-surgery? Because a lot of people, I think, neglect to do that as right. well. Right. So, so we have the data that we have so far, and everybody is busy, and most of us are clinicians, so it's hard to get a lot of research. But we have really good data so far about knee surgery. Okay. That after knee surgery, rehab improves time to full weight bearing. It gets, shortens the time to full weight bearing, improves symmetry of muscle and improves gait, right? Now, we don't know if that translates to five years out, the ones that didn't have rehab versus did are gonna be doing any better, but that, to, to, to all intents and purposes, that doesn't matter. Getting your dog back to doing what they enjoy doing faster, mm -hmm. as long as it's safe, is mm -hmm. a good thing. Mm -hmm. So we've got quite a lot of good data behind that. We've got data behind rehab for degenerative nerve diseases, such as degenerative myelopathy, mm -hmm. that shows it prolongs survival time. Is that, is that wobblers? No, that's no, that's, wobblers that's, wobblers that's it. So, wobblers. yeah, so wobblers is Compression in the neck, and it's a breed related thing that tends to predispose to stenosis in the neck. Okay. Um, but degenerative myelopathy. But degenerative myelopathy is the one originally they kind of found in German Shepherds, and you get this progressive um, wobbliness, toe dragging, progressing to rear weakness, and actually, if it goes on long enough, it'll progress to front weakness. It's been given the analogy to Lou Gehrig's disease. So it's, um, it's, a, it's a nasty disease, right? But it causes paralysis, it goes slowly, and dogs, there's a, there's a gene they found for it. So we, wow. um, what we do know about dogs with DM, that they are improved in mobility and how long that they survive with a mobile and reasonable quality of life if they have rehab. So, so those are the ones at the top of my head. There's some stuff about after back surgery too. So there's a little bit more evidence nowadays than there was when I, I started doing this, the canine rehab, 11 years ago. So, mm -hmm. But you yourself have seen all kinds of... I mean, yeah, you know. and I try and look at my success mm -hmm. rates, so I, I'm trying to get them written up again. Busy clinician don't tend to write them up, but so as an example, if I use therapeutic ultrasound to treat a muscle injury, uh, when I look back at my number of cases, I think I'm a... It's hard because when you're doing a research study, you have to exclude people you lost contact with and things like that. Sure. So I've got about 130 something cases, and we've got an 86% success rate. Really? For, and, and, and I think 90 of those were athletes. So that success to me, return to sport, is, is an outcome measure of success. So, wow. so, so you know, those things I've got to get my behind in gear and finish writing that up. But those things are just trying to look, and that some colleagues have done elbow arthritis, laser therapy, does it improve movement? Yeah. Yes, it does. Yeah. So we're, we're working on getting more research, but there is enough out there. I mean, there's far more research out there than there is for some other things in, in all of medicine. So Interesting. Yeah. Wow, crazy. All right, let's keep on here. Um, so what do you see more? I mean, you also deal with genetic issues, though. You deal with, because I've been in here and seen dogs that were obviously born with missing limbs and things, you mean? Well, not, I'm sure that's some of it, but uh, I think there was a Great Dane that I saw here that had some really weird stuff going on where you had to like do something with the feet because it had some... Oh, some contracture. So yeah, we've actually used Botox to get the muscles to relax in a contracted muscle situation. Botox. Yeah, it's crazy, yeah. But you, they do it for people with muscle contracture too. Obviously, we tried a lot of other things first. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So we've used that before. But you now. do end up seeing genetic issues. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and, and genetics kind of. And I'm going to get a bit too nerdy here, but mm -hmm. please, genetic. Please. Your genes might predispose you to something, but it's the environment and what happened to you after birth that 
probably caused it. And so we call them congenital, which okay. tends to be, the, or developmental. Okay. Yeah, but yes, that whole gamut of young dog problems that are associated with growth and their genetic predisposition. Yeah, we, we do deal with those. And if you can intervene early enough with a few of them, you can, you can help to change things. So growth plate inflammation, you can reduce. Yeah. You can, you know, those cartilage flaps that they develop, you can try and deal with early so they get the healthiest joint possible for long term. Hip dysplasia dogs, you can try and improve their joint health. There's a great study just helping puppies out with that. Is that through uh, movement exercises or is that through nutrition? It's usually a combination of, of all of those of things. Of so nutrition, um, providing um, ingredients for healthy cartilage by supplement or medicine. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then also, yeah, careful controlled loading to try and get. So the whole principle of rehab in, in my brain, mm -hmm. um, which again, everybody interprets things differently, mm -hmm. is, is making the tissue environment optimal for healing. Same thing as surgery. Mm -hmm. But with rehab, what you're doing is you're trying to make that local environment optimal. But then what you're also doing is progressively, incrementally adding teeny tiny amounts of load because the body knows in response to a weight bearing load, mm -hmm. it's going to put more scaffolding or more structure in there. Mm -hmm. But it's not only the right strength, it's also the right um, elasticity and all these other things. Mm -hmm. And we know too much load is bad, and there's a lot of great research on this. Too much load is bad, too little load is bad. You've mm -hmm. got to be careful so somewhere in the in-between. And, and that's, that's where the science meets the art, because you yeah. start to have, you know, how do I deal with this dog that's bouncing off the walls? Mm -hmm. And I know I've got to be really careful about how many impacts he has on that joint today right now, because we're trying to progressively get back to where we should be yeah. after a joint lesion. So super careful control. Yeah. And I have to factor in the craziness in the day into how much load we're doing. Sometimes I have to let that ride and say, okay, we're not going to keep him quiet as we want him to. So everything else is going to progress less quickly because we it's have to balancing. put that in. Yeah. And, and that's much more with humans, I think, than with humans. I presume some humans are non-compliant with, yeah. their, with their exercises and myself included sometimes, yeah. but yeah. I think it's a, more of a challenge to make it more fun. Super, 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 super. So um, <clears throat> I was going to ask you, like, what are some of the new things that you were just, what are some of the new things that are happening right now that are exciting for you, A, and then B, if you can do it in one or, or the same, you were telling me about jumping. When we got right, here, right. And how you were, you were talking about landings with jumping and you were doing right. some research about what would be. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so, so maybe we'll do that one first because I forgot your first question okay. already, but you can ask okay. me again in a minute. Okay. Um, so so this, I, my curiosity was piqued because as a dog gets older and they're doing the sport of agility jumping, people always say to me I should drop, drop the jump height for my healthy dog because they're, they've reached X amount of years now and mm -hmm. I feel like it would be better for them. And my basic foundational training in both surgery and basic science mm -hmm. says to me tissue response to impact you train impact so you train for the sport you do mm -hmm. and you expose yourself to adequate impact for that sport right mm -hmm. and as long as you maintain that adequate exposure enough times a week like if I run less than three times a week I'm not going to be as strong in my joints as if I run too infrequently right yes, or it's, yes. it's in too frequent versus too infrequent uh -huh. anyway so i started to get this curiosity because what happened when i had clients who did preventatively drop the jump height in their older dogs is the older dogs started to run faster because their trajectory over the jumps flatter sure. so they're landing landing further away mm -hmm. they're running faster they're older so we know dogs cerebellum the balance part of their brain ages and as it ages you get we as well get less good fine motor control, which you can reverse some of that with training. So you've got a slightly, and I'm exaggerating, a slightly klutzy dog who's now moving faster on the agility course because you've dropped jump height. So this is where my curiosity was peaked to say, I don't think that that's necessarily a good thing. If, if, if this dog feels like they're pain free and they're doing well, why would I decrease the impact on this dog? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna lose cartilage strength and bone strength Mm -hmm. And we're going to have a faster dog 
and perhaps the person who's going to have to handle is going to have to get used to that faster dog as well. So the handling is going to have to change. Otherwise, you're going to miss entries. You're going to be off course. It's timing is, impact, is just right. crazy in that stuff. Yeah, and also the, the biomechanics of jumping is if they don't choose an efficient trajectory, again, you're working way harder, and so you're more likely to injure yourself. So if you're going too fast and you're off course, and you have to turn to go over even a lower jump, is that more risk? So I started to look at how much we really know about it, which is the honest answer is not very much. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were talking about the force of landing on over high jumps versus low jumps. But there was some work on how far away they land based on the size and the height of the jump. So it was confirmed, which I knew from just looking at the dog, but it's nice to have the science. Mm -hmm. They land further away, they move faster, the lower obstacle. So then, you know, I'm not sure we're doing our old dogs any favors if they don't have anything wrong with them. Sure. And the other thing is too, they you know the, I would assume that the dog has a has a you know self preservation, self regulation. Mm -hmm. They're gonna, you know, if they if they get too much going behind, like you said, they could they could mistime some other things and then right. have like a detrimental injury. Right, and that's what I was concerned about because as well, you know, you get in a habit. It's again, I'm going to reference me running, but when I get into my sort of easy running speed. Mm -hmm things go so much better than if I have to suddenly accelerate because somebody's said hello to me and good morning and I want to look better. <laughs> so I speed up. No, I'm kidding. Um, but it, not. Right, no, 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 but not much, yeah. But yeah, I think that that's a really good um, example to say that you're starting to get your timings off. And, and then if a dog is a pro and they've been jumping agility for six, seven years mm -hmm. and they've got, they know their timing despite the course because they know their stride length and how they move, mm -hmm. you change all of that by throwing everything off for jump landing, potentially in a senior dog who may have less ability to quickly adapt from the brain point of view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. potential for injury. What do you think of dog diving? while we're talking about jumping? You know, I don't see very many dog diving dogs unless they do other sports as well, which would love, I'd love to believe that they don't get injured very often, but I don't know that it is that. I think it's just that the place that most people do dog diving is down in Mankato. Mm -hmm. So it's not as near to me. Mm -hmm. But I do have dogs coming from other states, so I don't know if it's just that. They say back injuries. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen, again, Cold a lot tail. of things. Cold tail as well, yeah. Uh, so that's any swimming dog, right? So, yeah. But yeah, I, I don't see a lot of issues but it doesn't mean that they don't happen. It's just I like, honestly don't have the experience unless they do other things too. Mm -hmm. I'm just, I don't know. I'm curious about the whole thing because, you know, it seemingly is low impact. Mm -hmm. But the thing Depending that, if you do a belly flop. You it, know. Well, yeah, that's mm -hmm. what I, but it's seemingly low impact. I'm right. wondering how low impact it actually really is. is. And, and I had my friend on, Steve, who's a, he has a pool and travels around the country mm -hmm. and does all these events. He's a really nice guy to watch it all. The other thing we were both talking about is it's tricky because you, it's one of those sports that's, uh, it's like, um, I mean, it's almost like a sprinter in a way, like you have to run and jump, like a long Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a plyometric, right, an explosive yeah. exercise, explosive exactly. contraction. So you stand in line with 12 dogs mm, for completely, 15 minutes. Yeah, not one. And you get up on there and you, you, can, have, you can have a warm up jump mm -hmm. if you want. But there is no actual warm up. Yeah. So, oh. and that kind of leads me to another thing. I have an old friend named Dominique, who is a French guy and super smart science guy, but had this, I think, through more through observation and interaction, had this way of kind of warming a dog up. Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it usually involved tug mm -hmm. and kind of turning your head a certain way, biting dogs. Mm -hmm. so that would make sense. Turning your head a certain use the way muscles you're going to use in the job. And, and you know, do something with kind of pulling on the neck a little bit or mm -hmm. something like that. So. Is there anything that you could that you could say like not as far as because it's so it's so duck specific. There's no way you could say do this and do this and do this. Especially well, there is a there's, a there's a little bit of way because the basic principle of a warm up is just to raise body temperature and, and circulation. Okay. So enzymes in your body work within a certain temperature range, right? So if you get too hot, they slow down. If it's too cold, they slow down. Mm -hmm. So you want your enzymes to be ready to provide your you for the m metabolic. Um, rate of yeah. exercise okay. so you want to warm your tissue temperatures up mm -hmm. you want to get your heart pumping you got to move oxygen around your body right so that, that's what warm-up is and so the unique and rather fun thing about dogs which i try not to i say all the time i try to say too much because it gives people an out if your dog's super high drive and they get excited rub gillette out of auburn at the time he's somewhere else now but he did some brilliant work on on both field trial labs and on greyhounds mm -hmm. and getting excited made a huge difference to dogs warming up. It increased cardiac output, muscle flow, and body temperature. So not that we're going to get rid of a warm-up completely. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying, you know, when we look at 
human warm-ups and horse warm-ups. And again, people really haven't studied that much in veterinary medicine. Mm-hmm. But we've got this kind of unique and rather, rather cool thing with dogs is if they get this high drive, they mm-hmm. start to warm themselves up, they'll bark, they'll move around. Of course, there's those other dogs that burn themselves out before they start, yeah, right? Because they just, yeah, too, so. you don't want to get rid of all of your fast energy systems mm-hmm. before you start doing something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so, so, so really just again, the main thing is to get moving and get the blood flowing. So that's really interesting. So basically for all the sportos out there, get your dog in drive. Yeah. And then maybe just some movement. Just yeah. get them moving. Yeah. I usually say I try for 10 minutes, but you can't always, yeah. Okay. I mean, with people, it's usually like once you kind of start sweating a little bit, yeah. aren't you technically warm at that point? I think I'm no, obviously not being a human clinician. I don't know, but <laughs> well, I, am be, I am a human. Yeah. Um, so. I was going to say, I, I didn't hear a clinician yeah. for a second. Yeah. I was like, wait, wait. I think they said 15 minutes. I had a great lecture by um, Dr. Erica McKenzie, an, another specialist in ecology equine, and she mm-hmm. she does her own sports, and she gave us a great comparative between all the different species that they know anything about with mm-hmm. warm-ups, and mm-hmm. she was saying 15 minutes at least for a human, I think. Really? Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Now, let's keep going. It's super. So... That's easy. Just get your. I mean, it, I don't want to say. Like you said, it's not an out for the warm up, but knowing that it's cool, it's okay to get your dog in drive, mm-hmm. and that that will help the process. Yeah. Especially if you know, not all of us have all the time in the world to train. Right. And if we're gonna do jumps. Right. You know, and jumps are such a huge thing for so many. I mean, almost every. You know, agility, you've got jumps, obviously, but AKC obedience, you get into that stuff. Right. You get into the utility dog stuff, you've got jumps you've there. Got jumps, yeah. IPO, you got jumps. French ring, monitoring, you got jumps. Now this dock diving thing. Right. You know. Fly ball, how about that? Yeah. What do you think about fly ball? Now, fly ball, all the dogs that when I've been to a couple of events, all the dogs kind of go in super high. Like yeah, they, they love it. They yeah. love it. They're so already. A lot of energy. Up. The jumps tend to be lower for body height mm-hmm. versus yeah, agility and, and IPO. Shortest yeah. dog on the, the team. shortest dog dictates the height. What do you think about the idea of uh, impact? So really, to me, any impact, you have to train for it. And the mm-hmm. hard training is training for the box impact. Mm-hmm. So when they, they hit the box and the ball comes out, the mm-hmm. spring comes out with the ball, that's the thing that's hard to train for. And they'll use ramps and things for puppies to try and train them into that impact a little bit. So they're hitting their feet on the ramp. And of course, now they've changed that most dogs don't hit direct. They start hit during a turn, mm-hmm. which can help a little bit with, with putting the force distributed over a longer time. Okay. Right. So not a high peak force over a short time. Oh, cool. But I think, I think that that's um, a good point because it's same thing with agility. There's some pieces of equipment that not everybody has at home. Everybody has jumps at home, right? Yeah. For agility, and yeah. you should for fly ball. Yeah. But the big thing is having those more complex, like the A-frame in agility, or the wall, or mm-hmm. if you're looking at the fly ball box, all of those things are a challenge to actually try and train on if you can only go to training once a week. Yeah. And really, are you exposing the tissues to impact enough if you're only doing it once a week? I'd, I'd love to bargain two to three times a week, mm-hmm. I think, mm-hmm. but then I'm trying to look for the scientific evidence behind that and all we've got is some racehorse stuff that says young horses cartilage remodels and improves with load if you're careful so i don't have a bunch of science to tell to you yes you need to do it this many times a week but the basic principles of sports science across species have been exposing those tissues to that load multiple times mm-hmm. rather than just doing the weekend warrior thing yeah, and not be ready yeah. yeah i would almost think that that would be it's kind of like, you know, I work out usually like once every 18, 19 months. Right. <laughs> it works well for you because you feel sore afterwards. You must have done something good, well, right? Well, that's what, you know, that's what Irina says. It's just yeah. like, you know, don't do that because you're going to end up hurt. And, it's, you know, you get excited and stuff. Yeah. But so, yeah, regular kind of what a lot of people probably speculate. But then I know there's other people, too, that also think, well, if I just kind of go easy on the dog. And right. Baby and that, them. that tends to be what I come up against most is I very rarely come up against the intense person who's doing something seven days a week and I have to tell them to back off just a wee bit. Mm-hmm. I come up against the person who says, you know, they're getting older and I don't like the impact, so now I'm doing it once a month. I'm like, oh, please don't do that. Yeah. You know, that's not, not the best thing. No, I know. Mm-hmm. You, it's kind of like... It's counterintuitive, though. I get why people want to preserve. Yeah. They think not doing something. But, but even with an arthritic person, they've shown that exercise is better. That's why I read a study about <clears throat> people in a nursing home that they put on a lightweight training. Yeah. And it was crazy. The yeah. results were crazy. Within two weeks, difference. everybody was feeling better. People were walking that weren't walking. Right. And mentally, again, exercise in the brain. It's a really yeah. good thing. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> I'm just looking at my questions here, and you're 
Yeah, I tend to I tend to ramble, so no, we go over things before. It's <laughs> awesome. It's just my mind is kind of like. Oh. Dave says hi, by the way. Oh. Yeah, and he was like, he said, Dave was, is another friend of ours that has seen you several dogs, and I said, hey man, I got a, I got an interview with Julia, and he's like, I would pay. Whatever your rate is with no dog to just come come in and ask you questions. That's oh, that's said. really nice. So I was gonna ask him, like, what would you ask her? But then I thought, no, Dave's really smart, and half the time he speaks, I don't understand what he's saying. So he's gonna give me some question that I'm gonna ask and not know. <laughs> you might know, I'm sure you will. But um, so you're involved with a couple organizations, so too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like not just this place, but some. So uh, you mean I founded I founded the American Association of Rehabilitation Veterinarians, okay, but so it wasn't John Sherman, my mentor I mentioned previously, uh, his sort of urging because he said there were so few vets doing it right now. We need an organization so we can chat to each other and just say, hey, you know, what do you find with this weird thing, and mm -hmm. how do you do it? And there's a discussion list and things like that. But yeah, we we have a an annual educational track. Um, at, a, at a meeting at North American Vet Conference, which has changed its name now, but that's beside the point. A big vet conference, we have an annual lecture track provided by the American Association of Rehab Vets. And we're a resource, and every month I go through the scientific articles in the National Library of Medicine and try and pull up the latest stuff that might be applicable to us. So some cross-species stuff, but mostly horse and dog stuff. And so I provide a little bit links to those articles of interest to try and help keep everybody up to date as much as we can as well as a continuing ed. And, and so that organization's on its own now running without me, thank goodness. Um, it's a lot of work. Yeah, we, I think we have close to 200 members. So, there is. Which is, it's a lot in the veterinary world. You have to remember we're much smaller. Yeah, and, right. then, and then I'm an immediate past president of the Specialty College, American College of Veterinary Sports Medicine and Rehab. And where is, that's a... That's a, so it's U.S., but obviously we've got Canadian members, we've got European members, or the Europeans are starting their own college now to, to train specialists. So basically what the college does is it in some ways pushes the frontiers of the specialty by being not only a gatekeeper for keeping, you train people and you make sure they're at a certain level before they can be called a specialist. So yeah, they need to sure. be exposed to an adequate number of cases, they need like to have been mentored. Else in the medical field yep. to go through this Yeah, and then they need to take this rather horrifying exam <laughs> as usual right so yeah. but they also need to have produced a research study which is great because that's going to push us to get more and more research so so dr gabby my my resident mm -hmm. and i we're doing a research study on muscle function it's a very cool new way of measuring muscle function without any needles so you just put a, an acoustic sensor on the muscle and because the sensor is so flat it only hears the sound waves in that direction coming from the muscle it doesn't hear interference and so it's been validated in horses and people. And so we're using it in dogs now to say, what happens when an ACL tears, a cruciate ligament tears in a dog's knee? How do the muscles change from a bunch of normals we've done? And then how do, what does surgery do immediately? And then what does rehab do on top of surgery? Because we want to make sure we're doing the right thing. We all think we're doing the right thing because we think we're improving things and there's some of those studies out there that says it helps, but maybe we could tweak our protocol. Maybe the quads need more attention. You know, so that sort of thing. So that, if you don't have a resident, you, it's hard as a clinician to have time to do the research. Sure. But if you're going to be a specialist, you need to know about the research as well as about the clinics. So that's what the college does in a not, not really big, kind of a big nutshell, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. explaining what, what we do. And then we, we advocate for the pro profession and provide continuing education as well. And, and numbers are obviously growing. Yeah, right? yeah. And there's a, there's a bunch of equine people too. So yeah, yeah. Think yeah the equine people. And a lot of those people have been doing sports men for years. And so sure. a lot more experience. Than but I bet they're happy yeah. to see. The canine people come up. Well, yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, I mean, we're and we're trying really hard to cross-train our residents. Like Dr. Dr. Gabby had to go to Florida to, to Peters and the Smith, which is a huge equine sports medicine place. And she, I'm like, you've got to see the horse stuff because you need to know the level it's done in horse medicine. What are some of the similarities that you see or that you've seen so far between horses and dogs in the way, and then some of the differences in the so, way. So, you know, move, moving on four legs is, so when we're looking at jumping again, so I'm looking and nerding out of that mm -hmm. at the moment, mm -hmm. um, the power comes from the hind limbs, the power comes from flexion at the stifle and then extension at the stifle going over. So we know that we've got those things in common despite the fact that the horse is a hoof and the dog has digits, right? Mm -hmm. Multiple digits mm -hmm. gripping. Mm -hmm. So some of those in, in uh, parallel, but then also responses to things. So some responses to some treatments that we use are a little bit different between horse and dog, and that might be sheer size, but it might be also simple things like a dog's skin is very movable and a horse's skin isn't. And you know, there's so many little weird things 
the, 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 the structure of a shoulder joint in a horse and a dog is a little bit different. And a dog is very different to a human, not just because they're weight bearing, the, mm -hmm. the range of motion in the shoulder and the, the, the structure of where the tendons go is very different. And so we're all a bit lazy about sort of extrapolating, especially from four-legged to four-legged, because we think it must be the same. Sure. And, and it's not always, a, a big example has always been pharmaceuticals in veterinary medicine. You know, a cat will respond very differently to a med than a dog, and then a horse will respond differently again. But, but even across times of tissue healing and some other mm -hmm. things are just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. so, but we, there are more similarities in the quadrupeds than there are differences, certainly more similarities than there are between a quadruped and a biped mm -hmm. to two-legged person. But yeah, mm -hmm. so, and really just the training things are the things I take. So it's like, it's very easy for me to talk to an agility person if the dog is doing early takeoff or having an issue like that. There was an article in an agility magazine that said all early takeoffs are vision problems. I'm like, where, it's never, there's never all something is, is, is one thing, right? So actually had a dog with an early takeoff issue that was new and actually the dog was trying to make more muscular effort because the front leg swing was decreased so i found a brachycephalicus muscle injury which was that's that's the bringing limb protraction muscle right she couldn't bring it up and over as much so she had to take off further away so that she could be more force potentially to be the only reason you say uh, it's, it's just so recent i was swimming with chopin right you know is this yeah. he's like 80 pounds mm -hmm. you know, and he's as skinny as he can be but he's really just going really easy on him so swimming you know he's his panel kind of came back a little bit and stuff but it was good the dgp right good dgp man good dgp <laughs> we're having an advert time Dog now on pain right <laughs> yeah this stuff is like magic it's crazy okay. anyway um but it was just an inter interesting observation. I took him swimming. He swims great. And he's, you know, big and heavy and stuff. So I'm throwing the ball, and everything seems fine day one. About 20 minutes in, comes out of the water, and he's whining a little bit in a weird way. And I thought, huh, this is weird. But he's, he's kind of, he's a shepherd. He's kind of yappy. You know? mm -hmm. So I throw the thing again a couple more times. And I look at him, and I'm thinking, maybe your tail, right? Right. Nope, his tail's up. Everything's fine. The next day, I go back to swim. He doesn't want to go in the water like he did the day before. Mm -hmm. So I threw the thing. He still went in. He went and got it. And so we swam for about 20 minutes. And about 10 minutes in, the whine thing started again a little bit. And then when I, and I'm just thinking, well, he's just anxious and really likes the game. Because he kept bringing me the thing to throw in the water. Right. And with every jump, he got faster and faster and faster. Oh, he's and compensating. Eh? And I think, I think part of it was like, this is going to hurt get it through fast yeah yeah it's so, amazing to see how different dogs think through the problems like i said that that, that early takeoff dog mm -hmm. i wouldn't have made sense to me that she should take off early i would think if she took off nearer she could power up higher and not have to lift with the front mm -hmm. but she, as we watched her progress she started to tick the bar with that left front the one that was affected so it was just like it just she could she, whatever trajectory she got from that takeoff was working that she didn't have to engage that muscle as much, but she still had to engage it and it started to fatigue. She started to... And the handler had no idea it could be something like this. She no. just thought it was a training issue. Or she was worried it might be a physical issue. So, so okay. the people, luckily the people I see are so switched on, they're like, let's just check yeah. it isn't a physical issue before we work on it as a training issue. Okay. But, the, but the, it was just incidental. This article had come out at the time and... You, you know, we do get to short-sighted dogs. It's, it's rare, but it happens, and working military dogs can have contact lenses to help them. It's, you know, a big deal wow. when you're doing certain things. Um, but the, the cool thing was to just actually problem-solve it, and this is what I love having this arena for, is I can just... I, I want to watch how they move. I want to watch how they move when I change the challenge, and all of that comes from my equine, both riding and sports medicine. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, then, and that's how I sort of translate it. Look at them before and after, feel them before and after, what mm -hmm. hurts after they did it, and how are they moving. And you can use slow motion capture if it helps you out a bit. Too. Yeah, but you were also talking about this like, like acoustic sensor that's like, is it yeah. like ultrasound type technology? I mean, I don't oh, know. so I'm not, I'm not bright so far with it, but yeah. So it's basically, it's sonic, not ultrasonic. Sound okay. waves are coming from the muscle contraction. And, so, this, is, and this is able to... So it's able to record. Yes, to record. Yep. So we take it's a Wi-Fi link and it records. So you put a little um, reading unit on the harness of the dog. It's not very intrusive, which is pretty nice. And they did stickies and you stick the acoustic sensor. And they've done it, like I said, in horses as well. 
And, but the, the skin motion's different in dogs, like I said. Mm. And so we were worried that the side-to-side -side skin motion would mm -hmm. create that mm. noise that the sensor would listen to. But because it's so thin, he's, he's developed it. He developed it for mollusks, of all things, for like oysters and things to mess and muscle contract. It's very cool. Um, but anyway, it only hears the sound waves in the one direction. So the skin's going this way, the muscle contraction's going this way. Oh, nice. So, so, you, so, this, so it's negated completely. Yeah. And you can... And you can wow. turn up the sensitivity if you've got a muscle, because some muscles, they contract at a low level consistently, or not consistently, but through most of the gait cycle, and other muscles, they have a peak, right? So yeah. you've got to, you can turn the sensitivity down for different muscles, which oh, is nice. Oh, that's so cool. Yeah, it's going to be very interesting to look what we get. Well, yeah, you're going you're gonna to have seemingly instant information mm -hmm. as to if what you're doing is working or not, if it's improving. Right. Because the, the body doesn't lie, right? Like, after you... Yep. Then that's the thing. Is that the thing? And you know, you have enough time to take enough repetitive measurements that you, you any sort of aberrant motions or anything, you 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 iron them out with taking enough gait footfalls basically mm -hmm. to do that. So it's very. And we've got a pressure map that shows how much pressure they're putting through each leg, and that's been validated. So that tells you, hey, if you're more than ten percent asymmetric, you're probably limping. Well, an experienced vet can see if someone's limping, right? But if a dog's limping. But yeah, it's really so it's nice to have. Sorry, <laughs> it's, well, horse fat certainly can. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's nice to see that improvement over time, so that computer can measure if there's improvement over time, not only in the muscle function but in the amount of limb use pressure through that leg. So, so we can we can correlate the two, hopefully. So cool. It's very cool equipment, and it's very minimally invasive, which is wonderful because then the dogs aren't thinking about what the heck's this thing on me. And, you know. it's, it's just so cool to have that. Interview. I mean, anybody who's serious about any type right. of, you know, serious training. Right. And, you know, the reality is, like you said earlier, the weekend warriors and my friend Dave said, you're going to do it. You can't be a weekend warrior. No, you not know, really. Tunnel, anything you're going to do that's competitive. Right. And this whole thing is geared towards these people who are kind of doing this stuff. So mm -hmm. what do you think about the idea of preventative, uh, right, not uh, it, regular or intermittent or prescribed whatever, chiropractic? for dogs who, you know, whatever, who are, who are just active, who are, yeah, it's people a, it's who are doing stuff. Maybe there's no real sign of injury. Everything seems okay. Yeah, a, the the it, biggest it, value I see for any of those things are just that somebody has their hands on the dog who's not the owner. It's, it's just, just like with my own dog, I'd rather have one of my colleagues here feel my dog because I pet my dog every day. Mm. And so even though I'm skilled, my subjectivity is going to be even worse, right? So, so having somebody with their hands on the dog, whether it's a massage therapist or someone doing manual therapy, such as chiropractic or spinal manipulation, is a way of looking up for red flags. Mm. I'm not so much, and again, I'm, not, I'm chiropractically changed, trained only in that I know how to do the manipulations, but the whole philosophy behind chiropractic is very different to veterinary medicine and all these other things, right? Resetting the body back to their normal. My view is if you have to keep re resetting a body back to the normal on a really regular basis then there's something going on else something else going on with that body that's, right that's and fair enough it might just be you're, you're older and you've got a little spinal arthritis and that, therefore that's fine mm -hmm. but we need the three words from my the people who train me in this why is that it probably should be emblazoned on my gravestone because they're the most important words why is that mm -hmm. not you know don't just keep blindly doing the same thing mm -hmm. but I do think regular massage or regular body work in some way is really good because dogs particularly will hide things yeah and because they can compensate i know they say people compensate but you, visually it's harder to see when a dog's compensating totally. so all of those alarm bells start to show up like i'll have a, a dog who they're getting older they're still jumping i'm feeling tightness and the shoulder blade glide isn't what it should be all those scapular surrounding muscles are tight i start to think are they really shifting their weight forwards and pulling themselves around now what's the hind limb strength like so instead of just saying i've got to fix the muscle tightness around the shoulder blades I say, why is that? Yes. Let's go back and see what there is. So we put them in a little bit of a challenge situation here, and lo and behold, they've got puny rear limbs, and they've been hiding it from us. And so now we need to change the exercise program to tweak it so that they can't cheat as easily. It's, uh, it's just that myofascial release thing. It's so similar. She told me that, you know, if my right shoulder is hurting, mm -hmm. she said, your body has this incredible ability to, to also mask pain. Right. So what ends up happening is... Your right shoulder hurts because something is out of whack on your left side. Right. And now this is, your body is producing whatever chemicals it produces to mask that pain. This shoulder is compensating. Yep. 
but the real injuries here, it may not be the primary injury yeah and this is where the problem is right. and, and and it's i don't know if there's anything to it but it seems like it works in this really weird they've drawn the fascial planes in people and they go some of them go diagonally so fascia is the connective tissue that covers your muscle and it used to be thought oh it's just a lining to stop muscles sticking to each line. other it's an organ yeah it's yeah. got nerves and it's oh there's some amazing videos on youtube if you look down at the fascial level with the microscope or zoomed and you can see how it stretches and changes and gets thinner and fatter as you move it's so cool it's, it's like a, it's like an organism just move, you know, right. constantly but any inflammation makes that sticky right so then if you have sticky you have re movement restriction and then so now we say you injure a muscle you're going to injure the fascia too mm -hmm. what's going to be the effect of that keeping those movement glide between the two muscles is really important and i think for those people at home like if you haven't seen fascial tissue is it fascial tissue facial fascial just, not facial I, yeah no but they do have people say fascial yeah. <laughs> yeah. anyway if you go to the grocery store and you look at a big piece of meat yeah sometimes you can see this that very, sheen on the top of it yeah, yeah. it's like a membrane mm -hmm. that kind of, and then you'll see in that membrane little strands yeah mm -hmm. and that is where there is yeah where it's where there's um where it gets sticky right is that yeah right? yeah so so it can get sticky all over so so what, what blood supply comes to it white blood cells exit the blood supply the blood vessels and, and transfers across all your tissues they can and then they, they release inflammatory hormones the, the the tensile and elastic properties of the tissue changes in response to how much fibrin collagen and elastin is in there and so there's ratio changes of things so that's all associated with, with with that. So easiest thing for me to say to myself is, "I want to just get sticky," because mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But it can get thicker, inappropriately thick. The nerves in there that are supposed to sensi be sensitive to pressure changes suddenly become pain signalers. So they're telling the brain it hurts instead of saying, "Oh, the pressure's changing here." So it's very easy for pressure nerves and other nerves in the body to get recruited as now becoming pain nerves, and so that's when you get these problems with chronic pain. When you have it, first of all, pain's supposed to be there, right? Because it's supposed to protect you while you're healing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then pain becomes inappropriately prolonged. Mm. And perhaps because all of us are too scared to move the area or guarding, mm -hmm. and you know, you need mm -hmm. guidance of when it's okay to move and how, when you can lift one pound after surgery, like that's what they tell you, right? So, yeah. same things with dogs. And I think with most people, it's because of, or you, at, at dogs, it's maybe different, but with most people, this the pain is, is so great that you're, you're, Intuition is telling you baby this. Thing. Right, yeah, and it's, it's a hardwired thing in your brain. It's, yeah. Someone comes at you, your injured area fast, you'll flinch, yeah. even years later. Oh, wow, really? Mm -hmm. That's we, they looked at dogs after knee surgery and up to a year after they would, even though they trotted perfectly evenly, they'd, they'd been rehabbed, they looked great. A year after they would choose to stand with less weight through that leg. Unbelievable. Mm -hmm. Wow, so that's, in that case, it can be the mental effect on yeah. the dog, which can yeah. then affect the physiology. Yeah, and, and I do find that anxious dogs seem to show that more. But anxious, right. and when we train for drive, yeah. curiosity, drive, we also inadvertently increase anxiety. Yeah. It's like intelligent people tend to be more anxious too. Are you seeing more anxiety? Well, I mean, you probably are seeing more sportos now because the word on the street, everybody yeah. in our area knows about you. So yeah. at least every way everybody I talk to, they all seem to know you. So it tells me that the word is spreading and you're probably seeing more of these people who are... Yeah, so the high drive dogs do tend to be anxious. But I think the other thing is we're, I don't know if we're seeing more, if we're recognizing more anxiety. Yeah, that's, that was the next question. Yeah. If it's, if it's and it's harder it's because you take the work away from a working dog while you're trying to rehab them, and then guess what? The energy's got to go somewhere. Yeah. So that, that's what you run into, too. But we do a lot of low stress handling, um, fear free visit stuff here as mm -hmm. much as we can. Mm -hmm. And so we're always so tuned into that anxiety. Mm -hmm. But we're putting them in weird situations. I mean, the underwater treadmill is a weird situation, right? That a dog won't see the analogy between swimming in a lake and an underwater treadmill. Sure, They'll be like, okay, there's walls and this is really weird. Yeah, it's what the strange. heck, yeah. right? And even though they don't necessarily always freak out about the treadmill belt, in fact, somebody was saying that's less than people freak out about the treadmill belt. Dogs yeah. just move. Yeah. But again, the confined, the weird situation, even though they can see through the walls, it's mm -hmm. all it's manipulating all very different. them, you know, in different kinds of ways. And right. So we use a lot of food. We go through buckets and buckets yeah. and buckets of trees. Well, you lure really, really good. I've seen it with a bunch of ducks. Yeah. So, and you really know how to, you know, and the thing is when we went home uh, after that last time, it's interesting because it's all, you know, when you're talking about that stuff, that's dog training. It's just dog training, you know? So uh, or training, the way training that you anyone. had us 
danger was in a real bad way because you know he had the, something the infection mm-hmm. and then mentally could not bounce back right he was thinking i'm not going to use this leg you know you got to make him use this leg right essentially so he was in like so far off in left field in the self-protection mode that mm-hmm. he was not even going to think about using that leg and we couldn't get him to use the leg but there was this certain type of lure mm-hmm. with you know that we had to kind of Bring it up and, and yeah, he had to get in a position where he could do nothing but put his foot down. Exactly. Yeah, but he it wasn't forcing him. It was just moving him in a certain way, so oh, then the leg had to go down. Know. He wants all he wants to do is eat the food. Right. So it's very interesting, and I could see where you could deal with, you know, dogs who have pain associations with places and things like mm-hmm. that. But you know, here I've at least we've had it, so many dogs here, and then a bunch of our friends have mm-hmm. come here, and everybody. Every dog kind of runs in that door and they don't seem to... Yeah, they mostly like coming. There's a few that are still a bit anxious and we help them with... It. Sometimes we use situational, just really mild meds just to help us do procedures if we need yeah, to. Like yeah. a rescue remedy or something like that? Or? Oh, I mean, yeah, but actual medication too. We've used rescue remedy. We've used um, oils, the the calming dog music that's got a, quite a lot of science yeah, behind we, it that we works have, well. we have it at the kennel. Yeah, it's really, really nice. It plays it's been at our great. Place, you know, and fun. they use it at the guide dogs where they train the seeing eye dogs. They've started using that music too now. So really? It's really keeps them calm when they're sleeping with the puppies. There's, there's, that's a whole other thing is frequencies and their effects on, you know. I'm into this thing right now called 432 hertz, which is, oh. we could talk to Brian about it. It's really neat. It's really neat. That but, would be interesting. Um, so that's calming, because I know that they slowed the tempo of a bunch of music for the dogs, for the, the calming dog music. So you've got like a typical classical music piece, and I'll have clients who come in and are like, this is the wrong tempo. Yeah, they slowed the tempo very deliberately because they found it was more calming. But apparently dogs and cats like country music. I didn't know that. What? I know. Really? Yeah. I remember a friend once saying, oh, I play heavy metal for the stress. And I'm like... Mm. But the thing about 432 <laughs> is a lot of neat stuff on YouTube about it. And I just stumbled on it, but I've playing guitar a lot, you know. And 440 is the standard frequency mm-hmm. for 440 hertz, 440 oscillations per minute mm-hmm. is the standard frequency for the A, which is the standard tuning right. of the world okay. since just before World War II, right? And that mm-hmm. was put out by this guy who was actually suggested for the British Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. So they wanted the British Philharmonic to play in this tuning. And the conspiracy behind it is that um, for 432, the Earth has a frequency. Right, which is where we get pulsed electromagnetic field therapy. Exactly. So I think it's like 7.8 is its root frequency, and then Mm -hmm. it goes all the way up to like 432. Right. So, and they know this because they took the astronauts away from the Earth and realized they were getting space sick because they weren't exposed to this they did. electromagnetic frequency. So that's, yeah, so NASA invented PMF therapy. Pretty cool. Anyway, wow. it might have been the cosmonauts. It might have been the Russians. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> so, we won't give so anybody cool. kudos, so yeah. we don't know. So cool. But anyway, so that's where that comes from. I just wanted people to know it's, it well, is science. The, the, apparently, this 432 was, was brought forth by uh, uh, Hitler's propagandist. Right, just before the war. Oh, how and they strange. wanted the British Philharmonic to play in this tuning because the British Philharmonic was like, you know. So they wanted to destroy, destroy the abilities of the British Philharmonic? Well, no, mm-hmm. what happens is when you play in this tuning, mm-hmm. it causes disturbance and disruption. When you hear these frequencies, because the actual frequency should be 432, in that, so that means 8 cents. So just slightly off, slightly. got it. So I read about this like last November. Right. And I play sometimes out, and this music I play is super sleepy anyways. Right. So it's really, you know. But I don't know. I changed my tuning. Do you feel calmer? I feel way better. Mm-hmm. But not only that, the response from people, and I do like dinner stuff. Right. Wine bars and, and dinners. Yeah, they seem more like. crazy. Like my tips have tripled. People have, <laughs> and even like I, I, love I, played this a hospital, I played at a hospital last week, and this girl uh, who was one of our old clients was walking down the hall, and I thought I saw her, and then I saw her the mm-hmm. next day. She's like, you know, as soon as we walked in, we heard that. We were it was so... Calming? Yeah. So, so here's a nerdy fact. You know, that cats will purr at different frequencies for pain relief versus calming versus if they're angry. If they're... If pain relief... Versus calming, calming. versus if they're angry. Cats angry. have... Yeah, they'll right. angry purr. So, because the cats use a frequency for their own pain relief of purring. You're kidding It's, it's pretty freaking amazing, isn't it? So if they have... They... Can, they well, we would have cats come in the ER because I used to work in the ER when I was transitioning. I spent time with the ER, transitioning from equine is what I'm saying. Um, yeah, and they'd come in purring. They'd be so injured they'd come in purring. 
It's because they're, it's like you hit something, right? You rub it so it feels better. Sure. You're, you're, you're changing the pressure receptors, how they respond in your body, but same thing with them. So how do they learn to do that? I don't know. Have you heard of morphic resonance before? Mm -mm. That's another grid. Um, Rupert Sheldrake? Mm -mm. Oh, look it up. Unbelievable. I was listening to it today while I was mowing the lawn. He, I know what resonance is from physics, but that's different, you know. You can use he, resonance to break things apart. He basically did a study with rats and chicks and then other things like, uh, other small things. Basically, he, he, he did a study with rats where he put them in a water maze. They swim out one side, they get a shock, a mild shock. They swim out the other side, they get food. <laughs> mild right? mild okay. shock. He seems like a really kind person. Sorry. So. Okay. And it, it would take them an average of about 280 reps or 320 reps to nail it, mm -hmm. to nail the maze, right? Mm -hmm. So then... Uh, they were breeding these rats in the progeny, which never would learn. Oh, DNA, you can do DNA memory now? You're getting into DNA So they would get in there and they go, okay, wait a minute, they're 280, now we're at 220. The next generation, they now we're further. at 180. Yeah. Yeah. And then some guy in California, this is in where you're from, mm -hmm. some guy in California, or New Jersey or New York or something goes, this is really interesting, I'm going to do the same thing. To see if he can repeat the same result? Different line, same, same. But different genetics. Different yeah. genetics. The same rat. Thing. No, they started at like 180. Oh. So he could develop this theory called morphic resonance, which means that information will be passed through a species. So it's called DNA memory. Is what they talk about. It's like well, it's like it's really like how memory. baby knows to go for the breast milk. It's yes. all DNA memory. There's no way you know that. Yes. It's DNA memory. But a lot of the science guys aren't really on board with that because they think that everything is in the genes and that the genes are like the the, the, the predetermining factor to everything. But like you said in the very beginning. Of this. Well, it's, it's nature, and the, yeah, it's, it's yeah. the expression of genes is controlled by the what you eat. The, yeah. It's called nutrigenomics, and it's actual science. You know, the, the expression of genes is governed by your environment, certainly. But but, but I think we're, we're saying the same thing in different ways. So DNA memory, it means that they've altered the, the expression of their DNA, and the parent has altered to which proteins they made, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yes, right? Yes. Has altered according to adapt to the environment, exactly. Whatever behavior it is, and that ratio or whatever you want to say of expression of proteins from the DNA template because that's what DNA is it's a template for making your proteins etc for your body uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, that expression of how the genes express must somehow get passed on to yeah if that's the question though. yeah how but yeah well yeah I mean does it I don't know because it goes beyond you. We know when you pass your chromosome on, are you just passing your DNA or you're passing DNA synthase and all these other enzymes with that along? Mm -hmm. And now I'm off in stuff I know nothing about, but I'm curious about. Yeah, it's super interesting. I'll, I'll send you a link to his stuff. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I thought it was just fascinating, and it made me think about... And a lot of times it's with like um, avoidance type. Well, rats, for example, they have to keep coming up with new rat bait because rats figure out... Well, how do you know the lion's scary? How do you know that the roar of a lion is going to kill you? I mean, how do you know that? But the first time you hear a lion's roar, my goodness. Yeah. I heard one at the zoo. We were at Como Zoo doing something. Oh, maybe it was somewhere else in the zoo. But anyway, yeah. and we were having some sort of reception, and this lion roared, and I was like, by golly, I would run a mile yeah, up, if I heard that. Up. I was at a zoo in Omaha, yeah. and all the cats were out of were, I've never seen so much activity. And it was like a Henry Dorley Zoo. They got a big cat thing right. going on. The tigers were running, and everything was exciting. And then I look, and I, I and it's in this building, and I go down the way, mm -hmm. and there's three little cubs in one thing. And then, you know, they have those kind of glorified guillotine dog doors that they have going in between room and room. The next room is this female who was laying with her rear end towards me, and it was very obvious that she was full on in heat, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I could see it. Mm -hmm. And like an idiot, next to her, there's just some big door, like security-type door. Right. Right, and I'm, and I'm just looking at her, looking at the cubs, and I go, I wonder what this is. And I just grab the doorknob. Uh oh. I just grab the doorknob, and this thing, obviously, this is where they were keeping the male that was probably going to breed this female. Right. And he roared. So, like, meet him right away, right now. Yeah, he oh, roared. that is close. So, I wet myself a yeah. little bit. Like, it literally. You skipped. would. I, I mean, mean, it no. just. But how. That's what, it, that's what. If you go down to the basics of how do you know that that is scary? Yeah, I didn't grow up in Africa. Right. You know, I have no idea. Yeah. And, I, I and everybody's like, well, of course it's scary, but if you actually think it out, how do you associate that level of noise with fear? Yeah. It's got to be something in DNA memory. Yeah, he was also talking about kids and uh, how kids have fear of monsters. Yeah. You know, and like 150 years ago in India, tigers were killing people like yeah. crazy. You yeah, know? we're supposed, to, we're supposed to be 
fearful of things that move fast and things that make loud noises. It's right? fascinating, isn't yeah. it? Isn't it cool? Yeah, it's wow. very cool. All right, we're okay. So, Julia, tell, tell us how, tell everybody how they can find you. So, oh. Twin Cities Animal Rehab and Sports Medicine. Yeah, tcrehab.com is the easiest way, the website. tcrehab.com. Yep, okay. easiest way to find out about us and see. Are you going to be going anywhere, doing anything uh, nationally that anybody could know about if they're from out of town? Or they, or um, mostly, I just did a um, southern Minnesota field trial with people. I can't remember the name of them. Um, D- uh, hunting dogs? Yeah. Um, mostly I'm doing veterinary stuff, so I'm going to the International, uh, the World Rehabilitation Summit International Rehab Symposium, that's what I'm talking about, injury in agility dogs, that's what I'm nerding out on the jumping about. Really. Okay. Where's yeah. that at? So that's in Tennessee, at the University of Tennessee. Is it, okay, so it's in July, Meyer, August. that's my friend in Tennessee, can, is it Should open to the public? I think you can, can, yeah, I think you can go. Wow. Uh, one more quick question that I mm. want to ask you that I forgot. What do you think about pinch collars? In general, in terms of safety, mm-hmm. uh, compared to other types of collars, not harnesses, but collars. Yeah, you know, anything. So if you think about the way a dog would grab another dog, a brief grab. Dogs are so careful with how much pressure they put on, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, a near bite versus a bite, they know exactly what they're doing, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So I don't think we humans were a bit klutzy. I don't think we're any near, anywhere near as good as showing that. I understand the principle behind a pinch collar. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be that equivalent of, no, that's not okay, mm-hmm. and then so, you're done, yeah. right? Yeah. But, but the, the judicious use of it is a big challenge for, for people. But I do understand the principle behind it. But you know that versus a choke chain that locks, or versus a a slip lead that can pull and maintain pressure. I mean, I don't see that they are any diff any different in risk. It's just different risks. Is that yeah. a better way of saying it? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's difficult because dogs are so tough and so driven. Yeah. How do you break into that drive to say, "Excuse me, we need to do something else"? Yeah. It's you need something, and, yeah. and the way dogs communicate would be... Through that type of stimulus. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. I'm just curious, because some people are, uh, you know... I, I just, I, somewhere I heard that the, that, the, that the canine spinal manipulators across, uh, the, across the country thought that it was safer than a flat collar, when it comes to excessive pulling, safer than a flat right. collar or safer than a chain or something. There are like a lot that. of people who are <laughs> very opinionated, and we all do it. I yeah. all like, oh, in my experience, this is this. At least yeah. you can say in my experience, because yeah. people make state facts. They're not facts. The, yeah. This is what I think, yeah. right? Yeah. So, yeah. but a constant pressure over time could potentially compress the esophagus and the throat. It'd be hard to compress the trachea because it's pretty rigid, right? Okay. But, but constant pressure over time could cause inflammation in the muscles, it could cause problems of scarring. You'd have to be pulling pretty darn hard, you know, one of those dogs who's hanging himself by the yeah, collar doing sure. something crazy. And the, the thinner the, the, the situation, the more com- force per unit area mm-hmm. you're going to have, so a thin leash versus a broad collar, mm-hmm. different. Mm-hmm. But again, there's nothing that we know, and we don't even know about harnesses. They tried to look at all these harnesses. I'm going to tell you this because this is something we do know. Seven different harnesses supposedly not stopping shoulder motion versus stopping shoulder motion. Every one of them had no different effect on gait. They all shortened the dog's front limb strides. Even dogs that were completely acclimated to the harness. So we think we're doing good or we think we're not doing something and we don't know until we measure it. So that's basically, I mean, obviously don't choke your dog. I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying everybody's very opinionated and nobody really knows. That harness thing is fascinating because everyone in Ring and IPO all use a harness because right. you're having the dog pull, pull, get in a high state of right. drive. Right. And a lot of times we just will even have a dog wear a harness and, and train and jump and do mm-hmm. different things just because we're trying to condition them to the to harness, the harness or whatever, yeah. whatever else. It, it, it doesn't mean they can't adapt. It just means we have made a change. But, but it's the thing is what we're trying to do, at least what I'm trying to do with my dog, is no matter what my goals, I'm trying to maintain optimal health yeah and optimal muscle work yeah so we're, we're, we're changing things yeah. yeah and if that's the case then that's something that everything everybody needs to think about mm-hmm. injury is such a huge thing and a lot of us you know the dog doesn't tell us they're injured we can't no and sometimes it's that micro stuff that's so small and just not enough recovery time because they don't tell us anything and we keep working them and then it snowballs just like me with the tail thing from the other day so, right you know pay really close attention everybody to your dogs if you do have an injury yeah call dr julia <laughs> Thanks Thanks. for being here. Thanks. Bye now. Take care. Good.
You know, with braids, is it the same as with dogs? That you need like a forwards to backward ratio? It has to do with the uh, moment of inertia as the braid comes up. off the top of the head. And it's flowing backwards. It has to do with the angle of reaction. What about the trajectory of takeoff? Because we that was the stuff we were talking about earlier. Gear ratios, force I don't trajectories. Think it's braids. No? Sadly. Well. If only one could work out how one could have one's one braids could flying behind somehow it. find a way to harness the energy of a braid? The energy of dreadlocks. That. Can you imagine? I'm sure that that is in some way contributing to reg reggae music. Is just reggaeing as these dreads swing. It's got to be contri contributory to the beat.